Well, it's good to see everyone here this evening. And if you have your New Testament, you might be turning to Acts, the 20th chapter. And while you're making your way to that portion of your New Testament, we might make some brief comments. And first of all, lest I forget, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be with you this evening and tomorrow on the Lord's Day to be able to declare unto you the things of God, to get to know you, and uh, most, most of all, to be able, excuse me there, that's a short step, to be able to preach the Word of God to you, 2 Timothy 4 and 2. And it is our delight in the house of God this evening to speak upon the theme that has been granted unto us, one that is most needed in our day and age. That is the theme of reverence. And I'm sure these able-bodied men have very accurately, over the course of the last evening or so, have set out for you the definition of reverence, but we're talking about piety. We're talking about awe, fear, trembling. We're talking about a tone that really carries its way and weaves its way through continuity throughout the entirety of the Scripture in old and new. That's never changed because God is holy, 1 Peter 1 and 16. We therefore, as partakers of His divine nature, bow our knee and we come to Him in a way that is the most humble that we know how. There is something special about the avenue of worship. And I understand this is not the Lord's Day assembly this evening. However, it is an assembly of the saints whereby deliberate acts of worship, the preaching of the gospel, the singing of the songs, the prayers by able-bodied holy men, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 8, that these things have been made available for the Christians and for the non-Christians of the area to come and to be drawn closer unto God. And if any time in our history... This sermon has been needed in our own country. It is today. America needs to humble herself and come back to a reverence within the scope of God. You know, we could study all year about this theme. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 28, I'm sure that every man has going to quote this passage this week. But the scripture says that we are to approach God a certain way with reverence and godly fear. Now, I'm not suggesting that being here this evening that you have to wear a suit. But I'm just telling you when I was trained, I didn't go to preaching school, quote, <laughs> but the older preachers that helped train me, they drove that into my mind. That when I get up to preach the gospel, that I should be prepared. I should be clean and neat. That my shirt should be ironed. I should have a suit and tie. I ought to have a translation that's sound in the scripture. I ought to be ready and willing to preach and to do so in such a way as to magnify God and to allow the brethren to see that what we are doing is the highest work of all. I cannot imagine anything grander in this life than to be able to have the opportunity to preach the gospel. So the tone is set. The idea of reverence, the idea of piety, and the idea of awe and trembling that we come before the throne of God this evening to declare His goodness, which leads men to repentance, Romans 2 and 4, and to be able to set out the theme that we are to have a reverence to the Word of God. And we're going to Acts 20. That's where we're really going to build our lesson around. But I haven't, you know, he gave me a long time this evening. He said, an hour plus, brother. <laughs> but before we get there, I want you to see that not only does the teacher have an obligation, but the student as well. Because what we're engaged in is worship, and we are all participating. While I may be leading in the preaching, all of us should be searching, should we not, Acts 17, 11. But notice this part. Sometimes we get the searching daily down, but we forget the readiness of mind. Your mind, which is conscience, intellect, fortitude, and emotion. That's the four chambers of your Bible heart. Your mind has to be described as Acts 17, 11, readiness of mind. The right attitude is going to affect what you receive out of any Bible teaching. That's why the Bible says in Ezra 7 and 10, Ezra prepared his heart. The preparation of the heart on the teacher's behalf and the preparation of the heart upon the student's behalf, Acts 17 11, and when they meet in the middle, great things can happen for two parties, the students and the teachers, to come together in that right mindset. Something else we need. We need this very, very dear in the church today. Nehemiah 8 and 8, listen to this. We're not going here to learn... Uh, what to preach, that's under the Old Testament here. But we're going here to learn how they articulated the presentation of the Word. To learn that because God's character does not change, Hebrews 13 and 8, 
the way in which the principle is addressed because he is holy, because he is to be revered, because it is such a special and unique opportunity that when the man of God of the hour, Nehemiah, is recorded here in chapter 8, the scripture says that they read in the law of God, how? Distinctly. You brothers, when you get up to pray, as the man did earlier, good job. When young men are trained, we need to understand when you're reading scripture, that's not an afterthought. That's not something that's unimportant. When you come to read scripture, somebody's probably tomorrow going to read scripture, I'm supposing. Well, we might tomorrow to train them. But, but, but let's just say when you come in most places to read the Scripture before I get up and preach at a meeting and somebody reads Scripture, I tell them, listen, you need to be prepared. You read that Scripture as you were reading it standing before God Himself because that's exactly what you're doing. We're not going to be able to convert people from the world into the church unless first and foremost we take serious what we're doing. There is nothing that you're engaged in. I tell this to our kids all the time. There is nothing that we're engaged in in life that is more important than what we're doing this evening. Nothing. So when we stand to read in the law of God, we do so distinctly, with accuracy, with preparation. The opportunity comes to prepared mind. So we do that with great fervency. And when we speak about these things so clearly as to no one here should be able to misunderstand my lesson tonight. Now a mark, a mark of supposed scholarism today among the liberal elites is to leave one wondering what the preacher actually said. He might, right, he might speak of flowery words and go on to all types of thoughts and philosophies and yet never actually address the subject of which he was assigned and make all of the hearers wonder really what his position is. They say that's modern preaching. But I say that's ambiguous at best, defiant at worst, and not in harmony with the principles from the Old and New Testament. Nehemiah read in the law of God distinctly. Notice the next part. And gave the sense... We're not just going to read Scripture tomorrow or this evening. Then we're going to take the Scripture and we're going to give sense. We're going to make sure that right interpretation is given to the passage so that what you have is something to build upon. Cause them to understand. Do you know a lot of people today, sad, with all the technology, we live in a time that really is mind-blowing. Can you imagine the grace of God, the favor of God, having merely allowed you and I to live in the day and age in which we live? You sit at home and watch a war, war that's happening thousands of miles away from the comfort of your recliner and TV. Isn't that amazing? Not the war itself, but I mean the technology. And, and, and I mean, we've got so many things at our disposal. It's not just that you have access to a Bible. I've heard that all my life. But it's much more than that. You have access. If you have a phone, a smartphone, you have access to Hebrew, Greek. If you want to learn about it, you have access to original language. You have access to concordances and Bible software programs, most of which is free. You have access to as much information as most people in years gone by would have done, done almost anything to receive. And yet, we are as a population as a whole in our country, pardon the expression, but as ignorant as it has been in a long time concerning the biblical teachings. How can we be so intelligent in some ways? Most of you here, I'm sure, know a little about real estate. Oklahoma is a little bit different in Texas, but you know, Oklahoma is one of the last states remaining that we read abstracts. You don't even have to get title insurance in Oklahoma. You just have an attorney examine the abstract, brought up to date, and they go through it line by line, page by page, all the way back from statehood. Wasn't that long ago, 1907. And come all the way through every divorce, every bankruptcy, right? It has to be read for everything that happened with the people of that property that's in the chain of title to make sure that the title is perfected. Now, we can train people to understand how to do that. Why can't we all agree on how to 
come to the scripture. See, people will tell you, well, we can't all agree. Yes, we can, because everybody understands that if a probate in Oklahoma occurs, there has to be a notice to creditors. It had to appear in a paper so many times. They had to have so many days to come forward with the, the debt. That wasn't done right. Then the property you bought by that quick claim deed, surely you wouldn't be so naive as to take a quick claim deed in Oklahoma. <laughs> so I said, don't worry. I knew the guy it came from, and he paid his bills. But see, you, you're confused because that man got it from somebody. And that man got it from somebody. It's not a personal judgment to that person. It's simply stating it has to be right. Well, people in America take offense at everything. You say, well, look, let's sit down and let's study the Word and let's make sure that your religion and your worship and your salvation is in line with the Bible. And then we have all kinds of things, most of which all have one thing in common. They lack reverence. So that's what we have to do. In the tone of our preaching, we have to expand upon this thought in the pulpit that everyone in the church is understood and everyone outside of the church is led to the same point that we must understand that God is holy and that He is to be revered and held high and magnified above all. And there's no way to magnify Him outside of His Word. Right? Jesus said... If you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. His commandments are not grievous. That's all right. I thought you was coming up to confess, to confess fault. Well, I need to. well, we all do, don't we? But, 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 but you see my point. 1 John 5, 3, his commandments, the scripture says, are not burdensome. Luke 6 and 46, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? That God is interested in man but yet God desires and commands mankind to repent and to come to the Word to be saved. That is the distinctive difference between true religion, James 1 and 27, and man-made religion. See, there's man-made religion on every corner. This man may build a church. Quote, I realize the church is not the building, but for a lack of better words, we're, we're understanding it figuratively. This man wants to build one. Well, we're living in 2023. This lady says, well, don't leave the females out. I'll build one too. Well, the man over here says, I'll build one. So we have church houses on every corner wearing different names. There's good-hearted people. They're well-intended. But it's just like the man that took the quick claim deed and never checked the abstract. Now we got trouble. Uh, uh, I know, but I didn't know. I didn't know that... The, guy before me had a credit card judgment and they have put that on the property it's not that big of a deal you just got to pay the 19,000 off <laughs> and next time you'll learn but people in religion they think they can do anything they want under the banner of God is love well sure God is love I would say that I'm a father of love as far as little f relationship to my children but I expect my children to mind me I expect my children to listen to advice from an older person. I'm 43 now. I expect my children, right, to, 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 to have forethought in what they're doing. And when they make mistakes, it does not bother me to discipline. God is the best Father. He's our holy and heavenly Father. And the Bible says in Hebrews 12, it makes it very clear, what father does not chastise his son if he loves him? Our holy Father chastises us at times. Now, I want to bring us to Acts, the 20th chapter. In Acts, the 20th chapter, we have this famous discussion wherein Paul, with great tears, for three years, the text says, has warned these elders, brethren, night and day, that after his departure, the scripture says, soon after my departure, shall grievous wolves enter in, not sparing the flock. You have to realize that Satan does not spare the flock. He has no regards to any of you. Sometimes there's bickering in the church. Sometimes when there's false teaching in the church, you know, nobody wants to deal with things today. And a lot of these bigger congregations, it's not that people are all liberal. I don't believe that. Nobody wants to be the one that says, hey, wait a minute. I don't know if that sermon was exactly what it should have been. You're not going to offend me. 
if you ask me about something I preach, I would want you to ask me. And I mean that. I can make a mistake. I'm human. But I can tell you one thing. I'm trying my best to preach New Testament Christianity. And if I make a mistake, it's out of ignorance or honest. You know, it's not dishonest. It's not an agenda-seeking mistake. It's something I'm either not aware of or something I haven't got the full amount of evidence with, and I'll be glad to sit down and make it right because I want to go to heaven. And I know enough about God's Word to know this. How we teach and what we teach is important. If it doesn't matter what you teach, answer me this. Because I know y'all have got good sense. The day someone told me, they said, you've got common sense, Stubblefield. And I thought, well, that's not so common. Really what they ought to say is you have uncommon sense. Because common sense is not that common. In Acts 20, if it doesn't matter what we believe and what we teach, then why does it say that Paul was warning them night and day for three years with tears? Why would he take it to heart? Why would it bother him? He said on one occasion he had the care of all the churches. Why would it disturb him mentally and emotionally and spiritually? Why would he allow that burden to surround his heart if it was not important as to what people taught? Sure it's important. Jesus said the last thing to the apostles, soon to be apostles, they had not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost yet. You had to have that to be an apostle officially. They were called to be apostles. They had the final seal in Acts 2. But, but these men, they were told what? Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Mark 16, Matthew's account, teaching them, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all things. What's the point? Christianity is a taught religion. It's taught. It's education. God gave words, Acts 11 and 14. He shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Now if words... By the way, the Holy Spirit through the apostles and prophets communicated the word of heaven, God's word, to men. They wrote those things down. They're preserved for us. If God went to all of that to bring us the word of God, and he says that words are going to be spoken, Acts 11 and 14, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved, how could it be that words don't matter? Words have meaning. I told my son before I left, if you're going to leave this morning, go to the Aggie game, make sure you tell me the night before so I can feed your hogs. Now, that's not, you cannot misunderstand what I said, son. Am I right? But see, and you notice when it comes to religion, everybody sets aside all the teaching of grammar, all the reason, the logic, they just set it aside like it doesn't matter. It's almost like religion is an area that cannot be called under question and that has no specific teaching to it. It's just every man for himself. Well, this is not going to work. That's why you all need to get out tonight, call everybody you know, tell them to get down to the building where the Church of Christ Central meets at Athens, Texas. We got some work to do tomorrow. We need to get as many people that are outside the ark of safety, educated, taught, and brought in. We don't have long. Now, I'm not saying the world's coming to an end tomorrow. I don't know. Uh, nobody does. Jesus himself said, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. It, it, it might last another million years. We don't know. You, and you don't either. Someone said, oh, well, it won't last that long. You don't know that. You don't know. It's not near as bad today as it was in Noah's day. Is that right? So what I'm, I, we don't know. That's not the point. When I say it won't be long, I'm talking about the fact when I look around here, I see a few bald heads and more gray hair. I see people aging. I see, I see people, and even if you're young, in the scope of eternity, how long does she have left? Not long. If you take her life in comparison to eternity, every man ought to get themselves right with God now. And they ought to do it with a tone of fear and a tone of reverence and a tone of awe that Hebrews 12, 28 says. I'm going to come to God and I'm going to come to Him in a very pious and humble way and I'm not going to argue with Him. Oh, preacher, my aunt said, your aunt's not going to stand in judgment for you. Oh, preacher, my pastor said, no, here's what Samuel of old said. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth thee. We need to listen to God, not the voices of men. 
And if any preacher does not guide you towards God and His divine word, then he's not worth hearing. I first heard a lesson like this. I was young. I mean, <clears throat> real young. We, we had gospel meetings back in the day where I'm from. I mean, I don't know if y'all, I mean meetings. i am kind of toned it down tonight. You know, we don't, I, I don't want to just scare y'all to death tonight. We had some old time gospel preaching. Y'all remember those days? I'm talking about singing Raise the Rafters, Church House Full. That's how it is in Tennessee some places. I go back and preach in Clay County. There's 37 Church of Christ in Jackson County, Kentucky. Uh, Jackson County, Tennessee, excuse me. Four Baptists. Did y'all hear that? 37, Church of Christ, four Baptists. On the meetings, if you don't get there about a half hour early, you will not get a seat. Every the little kid sit up over here. Meeting sometimes spring and fall. Now, sometimes Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Meeting during the day for the older people that don't work or maybe the mothers that don't have to, you know, can come during the day. Leadership classes at night, 5 o'clock. Regular gospel preaching at 7. Some have two sermons. Have a meal in between. Now, all I'm trying to get us to see is if we're going to call men and women back to the Bible, we've got to get as serious about the church and about the pattern of New Testament Christianity than we do about our businesses, about our careers, about our secular education, about our sports, about all other things in life. Religion in America has now become second, third, and fourth. A lot of kids, I mean, hey, I, I mean, mine don't, but I had to fight those coaches. My, my kids are pretty good. I'm not bragging, but they are. But guess what? Oh, oh, oh when I, when I, you, let's just pretend like you're the coach. Now, listen, coach, my kids will play. That's fine. We won't miss a practice. But now, the only exception to that I tell you up front is Wednesday and Sunday. Now, if you don't want them to play, no problem, because you're the coach. Oh, no, no, we want to play. But did you hear what I said, coach? Wednesday and Sunday, off limits. Without fail. It, it goes pretty smooth, but we didn't know the playoff game was going to be. It can't help you. And I'm serious about it. I care less about that game. When it's on Sunday, that's the Lord's day. The devil's not getting that. It's not wrong to play. It's not wrong. I mean, my son was at an Aggies game this afternoon. There's nothing wrong with having fun when it's clean. There's nothing wrong with sports. It has a lot of discipline to it. There's great things about it. But my point is, if we can't separate what is most important from the other things, how can we come to God in awe? See, that's, that's the application, young people, in preaching. It's not enough just to define the word. You get up there and you quote Strong's and Vines and go to this Greek and this etymology. That's all right. But until you make the application, brethren don't know anyways. Most of them can't even speak Greek. Some of my brethren can't speak English very well. Ain't gonna fix it right all these. Yeah, I know how you, I'm from the country. So we get along just good. Maybe you buy me a cup of coffee before I leave. But, but what I'm getting at is it's very important to know that really this idea of reverence is not just it's not just understanding what the word means, but I'm going to approach God in such a pious and a way to, to give him honor that nothing is coming before him. Now, you guys know your young daughter, you're going to, let's say, walk her down the aisle someday. And the wedding's at 6 o'clock on Saturday. Are you going to plan a fishing trip on Saturday at 6 o'clock? You tell me. Truthful, are you? Because your daughter's wedding means more to you and that fishing trip. And if it doesn't, you're not dumb enough to tell her, and you're smart enough to be at the wedding. <laughs> Am I right? Sometimes we don't know. I mean, our mind, we, I know how we think because I'm one of those. we got to wrestle inside sometimes. So here it is, Acts 20. Paul is warning them. He's pleading. He's crying. He has a relationship with these brethren. When you get out, young preachers, and you start preaching all over the place, build relationships with people. Because, I mean, preaching like this is hard. But also, you know, take people out to eat. Go to the hospital and visit. Go down and pray with people. Get out in the community and meet people. Be a friend to sinners, Mark chapter 9. And I didn't say, I didn't say do what sinners do. I said be a friend to them. I mean, build a relationship so you can convert them. If we can't convert sinners to the church, then in one area, what's the church going to do in one area? It's going to die. 
So part of coming to God in this awe and this reverence is listening to his word. What does his word say in Acts the 20th chapter? Verse number 32. This was the text I'm assigned to. Everything else been introduction. <laughs> now I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give us an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Now, first of all, I note this. I can't help it. It's just my, it just, just jumps out at me. Who's the inheritance for in this text? The sanctified. Who's the sanctified? The set apart. Who's the set apart? Those that walk in holiness. Hebrews 12 and 14, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Well, how can a man be walking in holiness if he does not revere God? If he doesn't honor his creator? If he doesn't understand where God is and where he is? And there's a great gulf between God and man. And if it were not for Christ coming in the flesh, John 1 and 14, and building that bridge back between man and God, man would be helpless. Because God is above man. I heard one man get up and pray one day and grab the mic. I never will forget this. Daddy. Uh-oh. i got to do some rebuking in this place. Sometimes I hold meetings in places. I mean, I'll be honest, they're not all, you know, I got myself in some places thinking, how did I get here? Somebody heard me on tape. Guy said, well, we heard you on grace. I thought, yeah, you, you probably heard. And that was a good sermon. I mean, I preach on grace. Preach on a whole quarter right now at Lindsay. Every Wednesday night, grace. But they got that sermon on grace. But they didn't know I had one on hell. I'm a fair preacher. You, you see what I mean? I don't just give them on hell and not heaven. But I don't just give them on heaven and not hell. You got to be fair. Just like raising kids. You can't just tell them what they do wrong. You also got to tell them what they do right. You got to encourage them when they do right. And you got to discipline them hard when they do wrong. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything like that. See, even the language we use in our prayers, men, ought to be set apart. Matthew chapter 6. After this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. See, there's a difference between me speaking to my earthly dad and how I'm going to speak to my holy and heavenly father. That There's not a comparison. My holy father is without sin. My earthly father has sinned, just like I have. My holy father has never at one time ever done anything that would be, James says, there's neither variableness, neither shadow of turning. But my earthly father has. And he's a good dad, by the way. But so have I as the earthly father. My point is there is a difference between our holy father and an earthly father. But as earthly fathers, we ought to do the best we can to live like our holy father and his blessed son Jesus because they're going to judge how they perceive the holy father by our actions as earthly fathers. Jesus said, call no man your father. Now he's not speaking about your earthly father. He's speaking about father in the sense of an official title of a religious atmosphere where the word is employed. Call no man rabbi, father, master, holy one, reverend. Why? Because there is none righteous, none reverend, but he alone. So Acts 20, here it is. I commend you to God. He didn't commend them to their parents. He doesn't commend them to the elders. He doesn't commend them he commends them to God first. And by the way, we cannot know God or be commended to God and not His Word. That's the key. God and the Word of God go together. They're inseparable. They're so close. Here's what it says in John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. That does not mean. I heard one guy say one time, he, you know, he's, he's trying, but he's kind of like I was here this morning. Before I got that four-wheel drive and I was spinning on that mud trying to put the hay out, you know. Wasn't going anywhere. Sometimes you got to, if you're not going anywhere spiritually, you got to stop. Do something different. Right? What person was stepped in a truck? Now, it's got a four wheel drive in it. So I don't use it every time. I try to get by. But if, but if I can't go anywhere, I'm just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, I know, remember, that's common sense. You don't even have to put the new ones in park. You don't have to get out like the old ones and change. Remember how you used to change them? None of that. All you got to do is push the button. 
I can be going 60 miles an hour down the highway and just change it. I still can't do it mentally because it bothers me. I'm afraid it's going to tear it up. But my son has told me he's done it. He's, I know it can be done. My point is this. If you're just spinning your wheels, it's time to stop. Put that truck in four-wheel drive and let it do its work for you. Let the Word of God do the work. Now, I mean, it doesn't mean you don't have to do anything, but I'm talking about let the Spirit through the Word of God. That's how the Spirit speaks to us. A lot of these congregations around, Brother Clark, here's where they're getting in trouble. The reason liberalism, the fruit and fallacy of liberalism right here. They think the Spirit speaks to them just every which way. No, 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 no. The Spirit speaks to us through the Word of God. How do you know that? Because Acts 11 and 14 is one place. He will tell thee what? Words whereby thy, excuse me, thou and all of thy house shall be saved. Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The word of the God. Now, if this is the sword and this arm represents the Spirit, what is speaking to him is the Spirit through the word. Not the Spirit directly upon his heart telling everybody something different. It's the Spirit through the Word telling everybody through words came from where? The Holy Spirit to the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 3, 5. He's telling all of us what to do to be saved. And the same message is for everybody in the house this evening. Nobody gets a different message. Everybody gets the same message. If all of you got 10 Chevrolets, they've all got four-wheel drives. Everybody has that same button right there. Some of you just won't push it. I can't make you push it. I can tell you how four-wheel drive works, right? Yep. And if you're from the country, you got cattle, you know. You push that baby in, oh, man, it's nice. I wouldn't have a truck without a four-wheel drive now. <laughs> Marshall Keeble's preaching years ago outside the outskirts of Lawton, Oklahoma, not too far from where I was raised. And he was preaching, and he talked about a lady who had a big, long, beautiful black Cadillac. And he said, I mean, she shined that baby, and she brought it up, he said, a little bit late every night at the meeting. Everybody could see it, you know. And that's, be that's before y'all take, you know what these young ones do now? We know y'all got alarms. They take their car keys and they hit the alarm ten times. We know y'all got an alarm. You don't have to do that. Showing the car off. Well, that's back before they had the alarms. This lady came over the hill, big black Cadillac. She pulled right down the side of that hill, and he said, threw it in park, and click, 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 click. You know, too early. Everybody heard it. But he noticed after the meeting, she needed to back up. The car wouldn't, didn't have her transmission. Old cars reversed first to go out. She didn't have a backup gear, no reverse. So she had to go way over here and around that down in a spot and go back up. He noticed that ever. He said, your car don't have a reverse, does it? She said, no. He's trying to get religious with her, spiritual with her, on the teaching. He said, your car is pretty. He said, but personally, I wouldn't own a car, even, even a Cadillac that wouldn't back up. <laughs> Think about it. Is it more important to have a big, black, shiny Cadillac, or is it more important to have a car that's mechanically sound? Well, God is not interested in a show. If God wanted a show, he could put his own show on. Go to Sinai, the thundering and the lightning and all the things. If God wanted to show, he put his own show on. He wants to create, as he did in the beginning, and form all of the galaxies and all of the great things of the universe. We'll talk about that tomorrow. The firmament and the handiwork declare his glory. God did not interest it in a show. God says, if you approach me, you approach me with reverence and fear. I don't throw that four-wheel drive in going 110 down the highway. Respect it. Pay attention to it. Let it help you. The Word of God, God designed His Word to help us. A lot of people are confused. The devil's done a number on people. They think the Bible is meant to keep them from having any fun and to put a bunch of rules that don't make sense upon them and to somehow take us back to an antiquated time that's useless and long gone, that does not serve the youth of our day. That's what they think about it. Nothing could be further from the truth. Amen. All of the commands of the Bible 
The ones that were in the Old Testament for the Jews. The ones in the New Testament for all of mankind. All the commandments to whomever they were given at the time were given for an express purpose and for the benefit of mankind. They didn't understand them sometimes, but you don't have to know why God said to do it, to do it. That's right. Amen. Think about it, right? There are some things that were not just like this. I'll tell y'all, this will be interesting for you science people. You know today, if a young man gets circumcised, you don't have to be circumcised. Y'all know that, religiously. But a lot of people do. But you know if you're circumcised today, with my son, they said, I, I, I said, what are y'all going to do? He said, well... If you want to be circumcised today or come back in about three months. I said, well, I don't want to do it later. Let's, let's do it today. He said, now, we'll have to give him a shot of vitamin K in the male organ there. Well, why is that? He said, well, you're a preacher. I thought you'd know that. <laughs> he said, vitamin K peaks on guess what day? The eighth day. Just listen to this. It peaks on the eighth day. Still to this day, they have to get a shot of vitamin K so that young boy does not bleed overly. Now, do you see why God said circumcise on the eighth day? Amen. It's not just some arbitrary command of, of some out-of-control God that's trying to, you know, put down his foot on society. Oh, no. He's trying to help his creation. He's loving on them. He's trying to keep them from things that would go wrong. We see commandments as a burden. 1 John 5, 3 says his commandments are not grievous. That's right. There's a, actually a reason. He doesn't want me leaving my wife and taking one of you girls. That'd mess my kids up. Yeah. Right? It's not, it's not a burden. It's a benefit. Amen. That's right. One man, one woman for life. But you preach that in some churches, they'll run you out of, you know, they'll be cracking a whip on you. Let them crack it. Amen. They don't have any power over me. You don't belong there either. Yeah, well, what are they going to do? Yeah. They're not going to kill me. I learned a long time ago. Let me up in that pulpit and let me talk to the brethren with common sense on the right interpretation of the passage. We can convince most of them of the truth. That's right. I'm serious. Most people, if you said it before them very plainly, go over it and back over it, over it and back over it, over it and back over it until you absolutely are sure they got it. Let them kind of chew on it, like the cow does the cud. Let them chew on it a while. Think about it. Back off the top for a few weeks. Back when they think you forgot it. Come back and hit it again. <laughs> Two or three times they'll get it. It takes a while. Because it took me a while on some things. The main thing, that's why I like this subject. Because instead of going by every point that we got problems with, think about it. We can talk about pornography. Dancing and drinking and marriage. We could just list them out, right? You could have a six month lecture. That's right. a lecture every night on a problem in society. Yeah. But if we back up and deal with the root cause, that's just one of the root causes, Brother Clark. Men and women seemingly are not as reverent towards God. Well, it doesn't matter the position that's told from Scripture. If they first don't understand, we have to revere God. Because they don't see it as anything applicable to them. I mean, we're getting down as the close of this lesson. I won't keep you much longer. That's 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't mention the invitation. Yes. But I've never preached that invitation. Yeah. I'm a relationship one time. He said, oh, no, we don't do that. Look, well, he said, get somebody else to come back. But I can't help it. <laughs> there might be somebody here. You know what I mean? We don't know. So we're going to have to have an invitation, which means a song leader has to have, to have, to have a uh, song ready. But... But I just want you all to know, when we put God first in our lives and we come to Him in the right mindset, it will change your life. I know it changed our families. I, it's hard to put in words what it can do for your family. You'll just be, I mean, you may be coming to service on Sunday morning, but you'll be spinning those wheels. Christianity is more than about attendance, and while it's necessary, it's much more than that. Christianity is an entire way of life that is higher and, and that is the, the mountaintop and the very center of every aspect of every point of our life. Nothing as a family we decide without running it first through what does the scripture say? Would it glorify Christ? Would it be considered approaching him in awe and reverence? Is it something that's right? So let me give you an example. 
I'm saying this because we got some young people in the house tonight, so I thought, and some are watching, I know they're coming. We have the youth to our house every Saturday evening, usually. Not tonight, because I'm here. Two hours, I mean, it's about 25. Even in a good, solid church, they bring friends, and, and they're curious, you know, they're kids, right? Here's some of the questions you get. Um, I mean, is it actually wrong to have tattoos? I said, well, you're asking the wrong question. I, I said, I don't fall for that. Here's what I always tell them. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 says this. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name. That's the authority of Jesus Christ. It's what you're doing, is it authorized in the New Testament? Does it glorify Christ? Does it help you to walk holy? Does it, does it help us to be a sanctified, set apart from the world? Does it help us to, to motivate others to Christ? I mean, is it a good source of fun? I go on and on and on and on. Most of them say, well, I see your point. <laughs> no. What it is, you're, you're finally listening to principles that come from Scripture. I'm not saying that you have one tattoo that, you know, you couldn't, in your mind, move past that and go, hey, that's not the point. I'm saying we're in a society where people try to get as close to the edge. Yeah. Well, one lady said, well, why couldn't I have all kinds of piercings and pink hair? Well, why would you want to, is my question. Yeah. What's the reason? Is it rebelliousness? Is it a lack of love in the home? I mean, are you, do you have low self-esteem that you need everybody in the world to look at? What's the reason of it? it? It's concerning to me. But see, we don't discuss a lot of these things nowadays. Because we're afraid we're going to run people off. We're not going to run people off. We, we don't have that many to run off anymore. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. If we would start preaching, I think we'd get people to come. Let the day tell you. She does not go to the Church of Christ. She said, I would give anything to go somewhere and just hear a preacher get up and preach the Bible hard. And let the chips fall where they may. And I said, well, you need to attend the church of Christ. That's right. We need to get back to that mindset. So in Acts chapter 20, Paul had stated earlier down about verse 27, I have not shown to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. And then he has a meeting here with the elders, and he tells them, you know, take heed to yourself, verse 28, and also the flock. Notice that elders, take heed to yourselves and the flock. Who shepherd the shepherds? The shepherds do. They first take heed themselves. And then the flock. Sometimes you've got four elders in church and one of the elders needs shepherd. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So y'all need to read that if you're an elder. Take heed unto yourselves and unto the flock. Nothing worse than out of control elder in the church. Because everybody talking about it. And getting up and saying to the church, don't be gossiping, it's not going to stop it. What actually needs to happen is the elder needs to shepherd himself. And sometimes preachers get out of control. So, see what I mean? We can't have leaders that are not subject to the teaching. That's right. Because in politics when that happens, what do people do? Hypocrite. So we have to agree and hold everybody accountable in the church. Preachers, elders, deacons, nobody is beyond the word of God. Amen. Period. Amen. Well, my grandpa built this church. It don't make a difference. It, you don't want your grandpa to own this place. No one told me I'm just using that. People think, you know, sometimes I'll preach, they'll say, do we have a problem with that? <laughs> no, I'm talking in general terms. <laughs> so here we have to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, elders are the primary feeders of the flock. They are to make sure the flock is fed. All right, now, but here's what happens. We have assaults from the inside and the outside. Men arise from among you. You mean men sometimes rise up in the church from our own rights? Yeah, 2 Peter chapter 2 talks about that. Make merchandise out of people. They sneak in. Jude says, crept in unawares. What do they do? They bring havoc and rest, destruction upon the church. They do not prey on the strong. Let me tell you all something. I'm, I'm being serious. If somebody comes to you and starts trying to lead you astray, it's not because they see you as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. They see you as very weak. Yeah. Get this point. You don't get anything else tonight. See, some people... It's just like a lady that goes to a man. Not, not your wife, another one. So your wife don't know how to treat you. <laughs> you, do, you want this, do you want this girl? Because if she's willing to cheat on her husband or against your wife, she'll cheat on you too. Mm -hmm. 
She's the problem. She's the cheater. Cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. <laughs> I mean, you did, yeah, okay, same way here in the text with Acts. If, if somebody comes to you, some young guy that, that, you know, is trying to draw somebody away, some older guy, age not always a thing. But look, Carrie, I know you were raised like this, and, but I see a lot of potential in you. And these men here don't recognize it. And there's a lot of things here they don't know that, and, and I think that you can see See what I'm talking about here? The Lord's Supper, we could do this once a month. It'd be good enough. Yeah. And look, I found some Greek they don't see. <laughs> and I think you could be one of the elders in this new place. See, that's how, I'm serious. That's how it goes. So when someone comes to you with some other doctrine, other gospel, which Paul says it's not another gospel, but a perverted gospel, Galatians 1, 6, 9, it's not because they see you as a leader. It's because they see you as a sheep very sick or very limited in knowledge, new, new convert, they can get over on their side and start building a team. That's right. That's how ball teachers work. I very seldom, I mean, I can't remember maybe one time I was real young, somebody tried something like that on me. But I mean I don't have that happen today. Most people know where I stand. Just like you, right? They're not gonna come at you. Here on Baptist, do you pray to Jesus? I said, no, I pray to our Father. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. I pray in the name of Jesus. Cross chapter 3 and verse 17. Oh, okay. Walked off. <laughs> I'm that quick. Place, case closed. So here we are in Acts 20. And he's reminding the elders, please, 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 feed the church, but you're going to have this problem. With the responsibility comes sometimes a problem. The problem's going to be grievous wolves are going to come in and they're not going to spare the flock. What are some of these false doctrines? The New Testament was things like Gnosticism, that Jesus did not actually come in the flesh. Other things, the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Other things, the doctrine of turning God's grace, Jude 4, into lasciviousness, thinking that you could sin any amount you wanted to, and the more you sin, the more grace you get. And sounds like some of our religious friends are there. Yeah. Once saved, always saved. Hello. <laughs> it's wrong. It doesn't even make good theological common sense. We know we're going to make mistakes, but how do we be coming to God in piety and honor and humility, thinking that we can live any way we want to live and he'd be okay with it? If my son lived any way he wanted to live, on drugs, running around, sleeping with every girl in town, shacking up, how could I be pleased with that? Amen. I wouldn't be pleased with him any of that. I still love him, but I wouldn't be proud of him. It wouldn't please me. Would it please you for your children to behave that way? Well, how would our Father in heaven, how would it please him for us to behave that way? Oh, no. He loved you enough to send his son to die for you, that even though you did those things, that you could come back and enjoy a relationship with him if, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, enter into the church, and through the blood be saved. Oh, man, man has messed this up. Made a mess of things. Something my grandma would walk in, she raised me, my great-grandma. She died when I was 17, but I walked in there one day, and I had, I had, she told me to do some things. She said, you have made a mess of this living room. I had stuff scattered. She had the nice little iron doilies. Remember those? She starched them. She starched everything. Now, I wouldn't want anything else beyond that. I said, everything. <laughs> I was the cleanest, neatest. <laughs> I mean, she, she did care. And she believed starting the I mean, the, the real stars. I said, I walked up right. Yeah. <laughs> but she was, I mean, she didn't have a lot. But what little she had was in order. Everything in her house, she opened that towel closet. I can fold the towel today better than most women. Those towels were neat. Those sheets were neat. I'm serious. She didn't have a lot, but what she had was neat. When the minister came to the meeting, we always had it in our house. She always put the best out for the minister. Always. You know, we didn't have paper plates. I mean, she put out the china. You know, the Roger, remember the silver plate? You had to... She put out the best. We didn't eat like that all the time. She was trying to put forth her best. The reason I'm saying this is, as elders, when you're trying to put forth your best, when you hire a good preacher, when you have meetings, when you're doing the work of the church, but all of a sudden you have ravenous wolves coming and making a mess of things, don't get discouraged. That's right. One of them said, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit because I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't messing with all this. No, that's 
the reason you are in heaven. Yes, sir. The Lord said, feed the flock, Paul through, the Lord through Paul, but he also said, grievous wolves are going to come in. Men got to be men. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's kind of like the right tackle. You know, if you're playing football on the right tackle, like Paul, the Apostle Paul, I am set for the defense of the gospel. Well, if an elder is playing right tackle spiritually and he's sitting like this, what's going to happen when the ball snaps? He's going down. You got to get down and you got to look the devil in the eye. You got to fight. There's nothing wrong with fighting. In fact, I think our brother missed this sometimes. Christianity is a militant religion. Amen. I didn't say Islamic. Physically militant. I said militant, meaning spiritually militant. We fight the good fight of faith, the sword of the spirit. It's an, int it's an intellectual battle. Right? We fight with our minds, our hearts on the battlefield. And we fight in such a way as to glorify God. We stand for truth. It's okay if somebody in this town thinks you're a little narrow-minded. That's right. It's okay if someone says, well, <clears throat> he is a little bit strange. <laughs> because the guy that told me that in Lindsay, I kid you not. I kid you not. We go to McDonald's every day and order three hamburgers. With extra pickles. I'm thinking, well, that's weird to me. <laughs> you order three hamburgers. I mean, one's plain enough for me. He's about three times my size. You order three hamburgers with extra pickles, and you call me weird? <laughs> I'm weird because I don't support the prom. I'm weird because I don't want my kids hitting the, the beer. See, some of the parents in Lindsay, they say, come over to my house. As long as you don't drive drunk, just drink responsibly. I mean, these are religious folk, Brother Clark. They said, oh, the Church of Christ, they're so strict, and you can't even drink one little drop of it. Well, they're missing the point. They're missing the point. I don't have any desire for that. Now, young people may when you go, but you get to the point, I'm serious, you, I, I don't even desire the casinos. I don't desire a drink. I don't desire somebody else. I don't want all that stuff. I want to be able to have a good relationship with God. I want to go to sleep at night. I want to be able to treat people with respect and dignity. I want to have all my bills paid on time, which I do. Amen. Go anywhere in time. Look them in the eye, right? Call the plumber. They don't have to say, oh, preacher calling again. He wants it for free. Young people, there's a preacher. I'm serious. I didn't ever ask for a discount. Mm -hmm. In fact, I didn't like it when they gave me one. I'm serious. I'm a little bit stubborn on some things. Because I want to pay my own way with the help of the Lord. See what I mean? Do good to people. Be, be righteous with people. Live right with people. And so what's going to happen is when you're an elder, a preacher, member of the church, it's okay to be militant. And I mean militant again in a positive way. Fight the good fight of faith. That's what Paul said. We concentrate upon the laying hold of eternal life or the crown of righteousness to be only for them to believe. But concentrate first upon the passage that says, lay hold, fought the good fight of faith. As we close tonight, Paul told them, he said, look, it's going to happen. Grievous wolves are going to come in. Men arise of your own selves. Destruction is going to happen. What was the end teaching that the center of the lesson is supposed to be on tonight? Acts 20 and 32. And now I commend you to God and the word of his grace. What they will do? Build you up. Strengthen, edify, encourage, exalt. That is to, to strengthen the inner man. Satan cannot have a field day with your life. He cannot take over your heart when you have God's word hidden in your heart, the psalmist said. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Old Testament said this about the Lord. Thy word. Listen to this one. This, this is a good one. Thy word hast thou magnified above thy name. Is there any name higher than the name of Jesus? Acts 4 and 12. And you're telling me that the psalm said that thou, God, hast magnified thy word above thy name. And you tell me the word doesn't matter? That the Bible is just another book? You tell me it doesn't matter how we believe or what we teach? And one way is as good as another way? Oh, I don't believe it. I cannot believe this. You go down to the doctor and you, you go to the foot doctor. This, this man goes to the foot doctor and he gets there and he says, I need to take a look at my eyes. I think they're getting worse. <laughs> the foot doctor is wondering, why is this man here to see me? <laughs> well, tonight the question is, what must I do to be saved? And I'm not going to Benny Hinn. Amen. That'd be like going to the foot doctor 
when you have eye trouble. Might be worse. Amen. <laughs> I just said that. Yeah. I'm going to Dr. Jesus, the doctor who never lost a case. Jesus, what do you say about it? I mean, after all, it's his words. Mm -hmm. Right? It's his words. It's his words, John 12, 48, that will judge us in the last day. It's his life that was given for ours to be forgiven. That we, through his blood and his life, might find life eternal. Jesus, what do you have to say to those soon-to-be apostles? Here's what he said. Yes, Christianity is a taught religion. And you're going to go and preach the gospel to every creature. And the gospel is the good news. But it's implied here that when you preach the good news, here's what is going to happen. People are going to both believe the good news and they're going to be baptized or obey the gospel of that good news. That's why Romans 10 and 16, possibly the saddest verse in all the Bible. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I have sad news to report time as we close. I don't care who we are. It does not make a difference from the time that Christ died upon the cross, the church established in Acts 2, all for if anyone of the age of accountability dies, not having obeyed the gospel. The Bible makes it very clear, Paul and Thessalonians, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Therefore, it is a high time and a crucial hour for us at this appointed place to go out and tell everybody we know, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Words, Acts 11 and 14, that we told thee that thou and all thy house shall be saved. How are we saved? Through the blood of Jesus, through the body of Jesus, through the sanctification of Jesus, through his divine righteousness, through his substitutionary sacrifice that was given in our stead. But we access it through believing in the gospel and through obedience to that gospel. And oh, the time is right tonight. If there's anyone here that wants to become a Christian, I mean nothing else but a Christian, wouldn't it be wonderful to see somebody become a Christian tonight? Mm -hmm. And if you are struggling in sin, now we joked earlier, but, but let's not joke now, this is serious. If there is somebody here, and we all make mistakes of sin, the scripture says in 1 John 1, 8, <clears throat> writing to the church or the Christians, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess, verse 9, our faults, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our unrighteousness. Therefore, if there is someone here this evening that's already in the church, but for some reason you've grown weary or you've been, you've been drawn back into the world to sin, so forth, now is the time to come and to have prayers spoken on your behalf and be restored, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, to a right relationship with God. Let us all approach God tonight in this song we're about to sing. With reverence and awe, Hebrews 12 and 28. And may God bless the preaching of this hour and our time together this evening. And hopefully we can all say it has been good to have been here. Come as we stand and as we sing.